Shalom, I'm Rabbi Michael Panitz. I'm the rabbi of Temple Israel of Norfolk, Virginia, and I'm speaking to you from the pulpit of our congregation. At this time, I'll be addressing the subject, the atonement appetite. Atonement refers to the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, a day which takes us back to our biblical heritage. To understand what Yom Kippur meant to our biblical era ancestors, we need to enter their mental world. In some important ways, their imagined reality was quite different from our own. Only then can we take the next step, the really important step, which is to understand what has endured despite the changes and how the old wine of their spiritual yearnings has been decanted into new bottles. For Israelites in the time of the Bible, life was an insoluble problem without the presence of God in their midst, as indeed ought to be the case for us. They had a vivid horror that their sins, if unatoned for, would eventually make it impossible for God to remain. Their sin would have the effect of banishing God and dooming themselves. Living in a secular age as we do, perhaps we could envision this in physical terms. The great health advances of the 19th century often had to do with securing clean water. We built water treatment plants and sewers precisely because using our water supply as our sewage disposal system in an era of urbanization was a leading cause of epidemic disease. For our ancestors, the fouling legacy of sin operated in much the same way. If there is no way to conduct it safely outside of the physical boundaries of the community, it would poison them. The need to keep God present in their community explains the Bible's Yom Kippur ritual of the scapegoat. The English term is unhelpful, even misleading. We will understand the ritual better if we remember its Hebrew designation, Seir la Azazel, the goat bound for the wasteland. This was a goat over whom the high priest would confess his own sins the sins of the leadership elite, and the sins of the entire nation. Symbolically, the high priest would transfer the sins to the goat, and the goat would be driven off to the wasteland, where no one lived. The sin would have been distanced from the community. Their own communal space was thus restored to fitness, a place where God might abide. That was the ritual component of the psychological work of Yom Kippur, the work of repentance. We fail to understand the inner reality of their lives if we imagine that for our ancestors, the ritual was merely an external prop and the real work was only psychological. Both the emotional and the ceremonial components of Yom Kippur were indispensable. Each one by itself was necessary but insufficient to accomplish the work of atonement. There's a tendency in our modern era to downplay the ritual and focus only on the psychological. It would take us too far afield to analyze why that is the case, but suffice it to say that whenever we downplay the importance of ritual and behavioral performance, some deep inner need to have what to do will guide us to create new behavioral channels. The creation of the Tashlich ritual speaks to this. We do not know the date of the origin of the Tashlich P 
pilgrimage to the waterside in which the worshiper would cast either breadcrumbs or soil, pebbles, etc., into the water and recite verses referring to divine forgiveness. The first explicit reference to that custom is in the work of Rabbi Jacob Merlin, a 15th century Ashkenazic author. But the custom may well have been older. How much older, we do not know. My guess is that the custom is from the medieval era because we see other examples of liturgical creativity among the Ashkenazic Jews of that time. As often happens, when there is a void to be filled, we see several practices develop along parallel lines, and then one may emerge as the more popular. For example, the practice of having a mourner lead the Saturday night service surfaced at about the same time, the 12th century, as the practice of assigning one recitation of the Kaddish prayer to a mourner. But as we all know, the mourner's Kaddish recitation became universal in Judaism, whereas the former ritual, a mourner being preferentially chosen to lead the service after the end of the Sabbath, is somewhat arcane. In the case of Tashlich, there was another practice too. That other practice involved the waterside and the new year. It's very intriguing and maybe it'll be revived. Rashi, an 11th century Ashkenazic rabbi, describes what could be the direct predecessor of the Tashlich ritual. And I'm quoting here from Aaron Feigenbaum, The Origins of Tashlich. Rashi says that a few weeks before Rosh Hashanah, Jews would make baskets from palm leaves and fill them with soil. Then they would plant a bean in the soil. On the day before Rosh Hashanah, the plant would have sprouted and Jews would wave the basket around their head seven times and then throw the basket into a river. Thus combining to some degree what we now know as Tashlich with another ritual for the holidays that we call kaparot. Even if these developments date to the Middle Ages and not earlier, the void that they filled went back to the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. What would lead to the elevation of a practice of throwing an object into the water whether it be a sprouted beanstalk, a pinch of breadcrumbs, or a fistful of soil, almost doesn't matter, to become a part of the New Year ceremonial. I believe that the New Year timing of those new customs is highly suggestive. For the rest of the year, one might substitute verbal prayers for the biblically ordained ritual of animal sacrifice, and one might feel that one had thereby remained in an acceptable framework of worship. But the new year and the day of atonement were the time of judgment, times of life and death importance. This is when the Jews of the Middle Ages felt that their lives were literally hanging in the balance of God's judgment scales. It follows that the void created by the ending of the scapegoat ceremony was harder to bear than the absences of sacrifice in general. We know that the high holidays occasioned other acts of extraordinary piety, other ways for Jews to go the extra mile. These medieval centuries were also the time when making a high holiday pilgrimage to the cemetery became popular. The graves of righteous ancestors or of an esteemed rabbi were places where a pious Jew imbued with the worldview popular in the Middle Ages could expect to have his own prayers be amplified. The dead having finished their 11 months of spiritual purification and Gehinom were now surely in heaven where they would be effective intercessors. The Jewish parallel to the cult of the saints. Zaya guter better. Yiddish for be a good intercessor was the prayer that Jews would add to the funeral liturgy 
in bidding farewell to their beloved dead. Having a loving relative so near to God was surely a way of having friends in high places. If my surmise is correct, that the Tashlich service filled the void caused by the ending of the temple era ceremony of driving a goat into the wasteland, we can learn two general lessons of importance for our lives. First, religion has to breathe. We must allow it to adapt to new conditions, to respond to new challenges, to develop creative solutions to the problems of the day. And second, these adaptations need to engage us, both mind and body. We are not disembodied thinking machines. We are embodied spiritual creatures. Our Judaism will continue to help us lead lives of spiritual grandeur only if we involve ourselves in it, body and soul.